Hey everyone, um, I am on the hook here today for another boring video. I seem to be the one who's tasked with doing these around here, but this one is going to be um, kind of a lot of the nuances to do with boring holes by hand. Um, specifically with, with these tools, we have the, the awl, the egg beater drill, a brace, and a T-handled auger. And of course, these are uh, different in scale and different in operation, um, but they bore holes from very, very small up to uh, two inches in diameter. Um, so I'm just going to start with the small, the smallest tool here, which might actually be the most useful. So uh, these are obviously awls, right? Everybody has some of these kicking around in a drawer. Um, some of them are more like a scratch awl, which uh, like this one, I would, I would term a scratch awl. It's just a sharp point in a handle, um, which is useful for things beyond just boring holes. Um, this one is, you can use it for doing layout. Uh, they call it a scratch all because of how great it is at scratching lines. But the other thing about it is that you can, at the same time as you're doing layout, like let's say for a hinge or something, you can then lay the hardware on and pierce to show where the fasteners go, and then you can use the same tool to start pilot holes for that hardware. So, um, you know, everybody w used to carry these around in their tool chest or in their toolbox to a job site because you use it for all those kinds of things. You don't need, um, you know, a, a layout knife and then a, a little um, drill and bit to start for start pilot holes. Um, the all really does everything that you need. Um, so this is a scratch awl. This is what you would call, I mean, some people call it a birdcage awl. It has a, a square cross section. So it's a four-sided point. And so the difference being between a scratch awl and a birdcage awl, with the scratch awl, you're basically just stabbing through the fibers. You're parting the fibers of the wood. Um, this is the style of all that would be used for things like um, making a birch bark canoe. And it's really valuable to part fibers in wood instead of piercing and cutting because when you part the fibers to stitch something, say like in, in the case of a birch bark canoe, those fibers will close back up and it'll be a watertight hole. Um, but with the birdcage all, you actually have there, uh, these 90 degree corners actually are a, a cutting surface. So these, they're not what you'd call sharp, but as you put it in a hole and twist back and forth, you're, you're reaming out the hole. And you see, I actually have dust coming out of that because I've, I've cut those fibers away. So now I can use my, my vintage antique turn screw, right? That's not a screwdriver. And I've, I've bored the pilot hole and I can set my, um, my screw in place and I'm good to go, right? just with this tool. So with this tool, I can lay out, I can mark for hardware, I can bore, I can clean out under my fingernails if I get something unsightly under there, whatever. And we'll talk about more uses of this later because um, an awl is a very valuable tool to have around. So next up in size and also in complexity, this is actually the most complex tool that we're talking about here. This is a machine. Uh, this would be the egg beater drill, and this I have a little, I think that's a quarter inch um, twist bit chucked in there. And a lot of people, um, people like to hold up the egg beater drill as a great example of um, how to bore holes by hand, right? This is like the, uh, an appropriate use of technology. It amplifies your effort. It turns your, your pumping action into rotary action. You get a constant twist. Right, you're not going back and forth like with the awl. It's not an interrupted twist like with a T-handled auger. Um, however, um, I know a lot of people, and myself included, it, it takes us a lot of warming up to feel comfortable with this tool. It's somewhat awkward in use often. So I'll show you what I mean. There are really two ways that you can approach boring holes with this. Just like if you're using a modern cordless drill, it is um, horizontally or vertically. So if I'm going to bore, and this guy here, I have a couple options for holding this. I, I found that, that this, is, this works well, the side handle works well. If you can brace 
the top handle against your hip or something like that. So if I'm starting here, I can brace it and hold it in plane and get through fairly quickly. Uh, one thing that's key with this tool is having a very sharp bit. You don't want to be trying to burn your way through like you can with a cordless drill uh, and, and dull bits. Most people's drill bits are actually abysmally dull. And you don't realize that until you, until you start trying to bore by hand. You realize that you're, you're spinning, you're spinning, you're spinning. It's hard. It's not going very fast. If your drill bit is sharp, this will bore a hole very quickly. If it's dull, you should just throw it out and get a sharp one or actually just go and take a few minutes to sharpen it. Um, so that is one way of doing it if you want to secure your work in a vise. If you don't, it gets a little tricky. <clears throat> and I'll show you why. Let's say, first of all, you don't want to bore into your bench top. So I'm not going to be boring through here and punching out into the bench top. Um, so you want to run it off the side. So now, obviously, you've got a little tricky problem. So what I find works best is I'll stand off to the side, I'll put my elbow on it, and this is where it starts getting a little awkward, but I can grab the side handle or the top handle, which kind of works best here, and I can, if I can do it, I can hold it plumb, and I can see that I'm plumb. So now my elbow is pinning that bottom edge, and my top hand is doing all the guiding and providing a little bit of downward force, not really much. The gravity, the weight of the drill will do most of it. And then I can just come through like that. So it's a little strange pinning it with your elbow like that. I suppose you could use a hold fast. Um, I, we really like having your work kind of free on the bench so you can move from one thing to another. But with some operations like that, it might be a time saver to just secure the end. Uh, and it might feel a little less awkward. But um, the egg beater works perfectly fine. I've just never become a huge fan of it. Um, so moving up to the brace. So we can now bore bigger holes. Uh, it's a simpler machine, right? You don't have all the moving parts. There's nothing really to grease here except maybe the cap from time to time. Every century or so, I think these are traditionally lubed. Um, but this is a very, very simple boring device. And exactly the same, you can bore um, upright in a vise like this. It works well to brace off of your hip. You can put a good bit of force. But the, the beauty of these um, self-feeding bits is that you don't have to really push on it. It's not like a spoon bit or something like that. This will feed the cutting edges right into the workpiece. And so it's really key, again, like I said with the egg beater, it's key to have uh, your bit very sharp. Uh, with these bits, it's also key that it's very sharp on several fronts. So you want to make sure that your spurs are very sharp. These are what establish the perimeter of the circle. And then you have these two cutting edges here and here that you want to make sure are very sharp as well. And sometimes what you get when you get a box of used um, bits is you found that someone likes to sharpen their bit here on this edge. They'll run a file like this, which effectively rounds it over and prevents the cutting edge from touching the wood. And that is a big problem. Uh, what you want to see is that this surface is left flat and the sharpening is done from here to establish that. And this can get cleaned up a little with a file, but you want the cutting edge to be the lowest part of that uh, cutting spur there. You don't want there to be a rounded bottom on there. The bevel, essentially, you'd say the bevel is on the top. Um, but another thing that's very important about this is to make sure that your self-feeding threads are clear. And I'll show you. Uh, I was looking around the shop for some, some clogged threads, and this is the only thing I could find. This is an expansion bit. And there, there's just a little bit of resiny wood stuck in there. I don't know if you can see that. But this is enough that it would make it um, a pain to try and bore with this bit. And so here's another use of the, the brilliant yet simple awl. So you can use this just like a toothpick. 
and you can pick those bits right out. And of course, you want to be careful because you don't want to mar your threads, but you can just use this and go around and pop those little pieces of resin or whatever it was that was being bored here. You can clean them right out. And so eventually end up with some clean teeth. And it's important that they're clean because what will happen is you'll start to bore and it'll be feeding in and all of a sudden it'll hit this little bit of resiny wood here and it'll just stop feeding. And so you're relying on brute force to, um, to bore your way in through the board. But this one, this has a nice um, clean self-feeding screw. And again, you can use your awl to establish your point, right? So now I have my point. I can put that tip right on it. And when it's sharp, it goes in very quickly. Bores a pretty decent hole. Pretty decent as in um, the edges are clean when your spurs are nice and clean to bore through. But we do get a lot of questions about how to bore angled holes. Um, for example, in this staked bench and in any staked joinery, in any chairs that you make, you will have to bore holes at an angle. So the question is, how do you do that consistently? How do you keep your angle fixed and from wandering? Because as you know, when you're boring, you've got a lot of different actions going on here. Your arm is pulling it around. You get a wobble going. If you get halfway through this two inch board, and let's say it's, it's the seat of a Windsor chair and your angle is off, you're in a pretty tough spot. So how can you establish your angle for boring? Let's say you have an angle in mind <clears throat> that you wanna establish like, like the rake and the splay of your legs. And let's say, do, do you want to have to follow a bevel gauge the whole way, right? Uh, first of all, that's gonna get in your way. It's gonna be annoying. You're gonna knock it over. You're gonna say some words that you regret later. So a bevel gauge is great for checking your progress, but I would say you don't wanna have it there fixed next to you to keep referencing. Um, a lot of the, the trick to this, or a lot of the skill involved is just being able to sight your angle and maintain it um, visually and using muscle memory. But there is another trick that you can do, uh, and that is extending your, your reach. And so this right here, this is just a bit extension. This is not terribly old. This is probably, you know, mid 20th century, but you can find these things on eBay um, or just online. But this will make your, if I can free this up, this basically gives you a much longer hypotenuse on your, uh, on your triangle. So you put your bit in there and then you tighten it down. I should have read the owner's manual to this thing. So now that is nice and tight. So all of a sudden, any error I make is greatly magnified. I go from taking this thing, which it's hard to see what the axis is, to here is obviously my leg. And so my angles are very easy to check. I can do my rake, my splay, whatever I want, get fixed in one position, have that memorized, start boring, Pause, check, right? The old, um, the old chair makers of England did not use lasers and they didn't use bubble levels. They just would use methods like this where you're just checking and you're boring and then you're checking again. And so um, I would say that, see right now I'm able to see pretty well what my angle's doing what all is going on because I've amplified 
um, any inaccuracy in my boring. Um, so that's a, a valuable thing to keep in mind. Another thing is that old uh, Windsor chairs and things like that, none of the angles were exact or very precise. They were all off just a little bit, like the splay of the legs. If you go through old antique chairs and you check and you measure angles, everything is off by a little bit. Um, you can tell a handmade chair by looking at it um, because of that. But uh, overall, you know, it's, it's maybe a degree, maybe two degrees. It's, it's hard to tell by eye. It doesn't look wrong, but it just looks handmade. And part of the beauty of that, that fact that these angles are not all exactly laser perfect, is that um, those subtle tensions that are added when the leg is out by a little bit this way or that way, all those tensions add up to tighten the joinery in the leg. Like, for example, <clears throat> if you drive a tenon into this hole that I'm boring, and then you are forcing that leg into alignment with the back one by a stretcher, you are introducing tension into that joint that will allow it to kind of lock into this wood a little better than if it was just a perfect slip fit and all the angles were like from a kit almost. So introducing a little bit of flexibility into the system, I'll say a looser tolerances for angles, is actually beneficial for tightening up joinery. Um, so Adding length is a, a great benefit uh, when you're looking to uh, get your angles as close as you can visually without stressing out about it too much. <clears throat> but uh, the last thing that you might consider is how to bore a much bigger hole. And this is a good size T-handled auger. Uh, the same rules apply. Um, you want this to be even sharper, if, if I could say that. Uh, this, you want this to be a really good cutting edge, and this one is nicely tuned up right now. Uh, you want the lead screw to be very clean. You want to make sure that the shoulders of that screw are sharp. Oftentimes with these things, you see they've been abused and um, the screw doesn't pull very well. And if that's the case, then you're gonna be really pushing down with a lot of force and it's gonna be less than a fun operation. But because this thing has this length already built into it, um, it helps to eyeball your angle. So if I'm looking to bore, uh, this may very well have been the, uh, the T-handle auger that Joshua used to bore. These look like two inch tenons for this staked bench. Um, so you have that length to play with, to eyeball where you're going. And then you can start the lead screw by spinning it down, you'll start to feel some engagement. And you know, nobody's in a hurry when you're boring these holes. You can take a break, which is the beautiful thing about this. You can start a little bit, you can leave that and walk away and go get a cup of coffee if you want to. But you're gonna come back and reference again, check your angle, see how things are looking, and continue on. And the nice thing about that is you have plenty of time to make little corrections. And if you find, you know, take a few bites, check. And it's very hard to wander off when you're able to just pause and step back and check your progress. Um, but this will bore about as big a hole as you'd ever need for furniture making. You know, bigger than that, and you're using a coping saw or something like that. Um, <clears throat> but there are just a lot of little uh, tips and tricks kind of ideas to, to get behind when you're boring holes. Um, starting with the awl, it's a very versatile tool that you can carry around with you and do lots of things on the job site. And just moving up and, and becoming comfortable with using an egg beater because um, it will use any modern twist bit, and that's very versatile, especially for uh, people today uh, who are used to working with their case of twist bits, you know, and all the different sizes. Uh, this will use any modern bit like that, and you can chuck it and easily bore those holes, and it's really uh, kind of an interesting link between the old and the new. It's a machine, but it's powered by us. Uh, and then into these guys, which these will never 
uh, go out of style. There are some newer versions of uh, these kinds of things, but the, uh, the big old augers and braces are really the way to, to bore those big holes, like anything from a quarter of an inch up to two and two plus inches. Uh, all it takes is um, paying attention to what you're doing, attention to detail, step back and look. Uh, oftentimes it helps to have a spotter. But again, you can introduce a little bit of imprecision in the angles. And overall, it actually adds to the strength of the thing that you're trying to make. So uh, if you're interested in more stuff like this, more uh, thoughts on tools, maybe some more techniques to talk about, uh, you should check out the Daily Dispatch. Up here, you can sign up there. It's just $5 a month. Uh, we post daily on there. Uh, so yeah, we'll catch you next time.